Thomas Sowell came to fame as one of the first black intellectuals to question many of the policies advocated by the civil rights establishment. Today, he is in the enviable position of seeing many of his ideas, particularly those criticizing affirmative action, gaining increasing popularity. Now, in his latest book, he criticizes self-styled elites who, through a combination of wrong-headed compassion and egoism, have created many of the ills of contemporary America. I'm pleased to have the author of The Vision of the Anointed, a fellow North Carolinian, Thomas Sowell. Well, well, thank you. You still have family in Charlotte. Let's say that, don't you? Don't you know? Oh, I have, I have relatives out in Gastonia, but most, most yeah. of them are on the East Coast now, yeah. up in New York. And, and you grew up in Charlotte? Uh, uh, until the age in, of eight. Area, until you were eight. Yes. And then moved to Harlem? Yes. Uh, and then what happened? I grew up there. I was, at the age of 20, I left uh, Harlem, and then I've been moving ever since. You left Harlem to go... Oh, heavens. I went uh, to, first down to, down to Washington for a few months, and then I was uh, drafted at the, into the Marine Corps. Right. And uh, from there on, I went on to college and graduate school and all the rest of it. Wanting to do what with your life? Uh, well, well, I had to find that out, but uh, early on, I guess, I, I wanted to be an economist. Uh, I simply took economics courses, and I, I'd never, I had no idea what economics was about until I took the courses. And I found that I did far better than that than anything else. And so there was really no, uh, the choice was made for me. Do you know why that was? I mean, what, what part of your... Oh, I could speculate, but not really. Yeah. Was Milton Friedman a mentor for you? Yes. Um, uh, when I first went to the University of Chicago, uh, he was my uh, advisor, and I took a course from him. But that really was not the turning point in my intellectual career. I was a Marxist before I took Milton Friedman's course, and I was a Marxist after I took Milton So he didn't turn you from a Marxist to no, a Freiner Prize? No, no. But uh, what, what did that was working for the government. And uh, I began to see what it means to have the government control things. I was uh, dealing with minimum wages in Puerto Rico as a summer intern. And I began to realize that, one, people were losing their jobs as you kept raising the minimum wage. And two, that the Labor Department really didn't care about that because the minimum wage law was supplying about a third of their uh, appropriations, administering that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, in fact, I... I spent the summer trying to wrestle with the idea of how could we test whether the minimum wage law was really uh, causing these jobs to be lost in Puerto Rico. And I finally, at the end of the summer, came up with something. I, I felt very proud of myself. And I could see the stunned looks on people's faces as I told them this in the office. They realized, oh, my God, this man has stumbled onto something that will ruin us all. <laughs> you know? I was waiting for the congratulations, you see. Yeah. And I could see these stunned faces instead. How was it, though, for you, and I've, I've watched you and read you for a years mm. to be an african-american man respected by a cross-section of your peers and yet be so against the grain mm. of fellow african-americans well i don't know that the, we can say against the grain of fellow african-americans you mean fellow african-american intellectuals yeah well, but okay. i don't think african-american intellectuals are any more typical of african-americans than white intellectuals are of whites uh, if you went by uh, by uh, intellectuals, uh, uh, you know, uh, John John John, uh, John Anderson got more votes at Stanford than Ronald Reagan did. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't. I'm, I'm not sure. More, probably got more votes in Cambridge too. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. And so uh, intellectuals are not typical of anybody other than intellectuals. Uh, what was it that Bill Buckley used to say? I'd rather be judged by the by the first twelve people in the New York phone directory than by the faculty at Harvard. Oh, oh absolutely! My goodness, yes, that, that, that's a very rational uh, choice. Yeah, but it was not difficult for you, in a sense. I mean, you, even though let's assume that in terms of uh, certainly the civil rights establishment, you were in in some ways what a pariah. Well, yes and no. I mean, they, they've had a wonderful way of, ha of handling me which I, from a tactical point of view. Yeah. Uh, they simply keep quiet when I come out with a book, and it's, it's a, it's a two-week wonder. Yeah. Uh, and then after the two weeks have passed, they resume as if it did, hadn't happened. <laughs> and so that, that is so much better than engaging me in any kind of debate, because they really don't have the facts on their side. Have you ever wanted to be, after that experience dealing with minimum wage in Puerto Rico, to be in government at any level, anywhere? I can't really think that I have. I, I've probably had more opportunities to be in government uh, since 1980 uh, the, the, than anyone who has never actually been in government. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, yeah, it, they wanted you badly because you would have been, I mean, well, you would have helped the cause too. 
Well, well, well I, don't, I don't know about that. I, I, someone, someone who came to me, I said to him, you know, the President of the United States has better things to do at this time than constantly have to be saying, well, you know what Tom really meant was. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Were you a friend of Reagan's? No, no, no. I, I, I barely knew him. I, I uh, sat in on a, a luncheon with 10 other people with him once. I, I, I was uh, impressed with the man that, one, he was not at all like caricature in a lot of ways, either intellectually or in terms of personal compassion. Uh, one of the things he described, which I thought, you know, thought was quite moving, was uh, a man who had been condemned to death, and the papers came to him, of course, for the appeal for the commutation, and how he went through these papers looking for anything that would be justification for commuting them. And the man was an absolute wrongo from day one. You know, there was yeah. absolutely nothing there. And he said he wasn't going to just overrule the court on the basis of, you know, he wanted to overrule the court, and so the execution went forward. And the night of the execution, he said, you know, there were people gathered around the governor's mansion, and they were, they were out kneeling and praying outside as the hour of execution came. And he said, you know, I don't mind telling you, I was in the governor's mansion kneeling and praying, too. That's Ronald Reagan. Yeah. yeah. Did you turn down the job of Secretary of Education? Yes. Why? Why, why not? Uh, well, because you didn't believe there should be a, a Department of Education? Or well, I, don't believe, I don't believe there's a Department of Education. I, I really wrestle with that because education is so horrible in this country that even though I knew I had been miserable in the job, uh, I thought, well, you know, a lot of people have, you know, people have been miserable in Normandy and Iwo Jima, yeah, and I wouldn't way. be here if yeah. they weren't. Uh, but I finally had to ha ask the question, what, can, what do I have the political skills to accomplish? that would make it worth the hassle that I would go through, not kind not of the hassle I would give to other people. And I thought, really, I don't have those skills. Yeah, and you had no ego drive to, say, be uh, at the cabinet of the president. You mean to have that States. picture to show you my no, grandchildren? No, 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 no. To be there, to be a member of the president's cabinet, that's, you know, that's a pretty impressive achievement. Not that you haven't had a lot of impressive achievements in your life, but that's a... Rather oh, it is, it is, but that, to that be a really part didn't of that dialogue. And no, I, 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 I've seen too many hangers on in my life <laughs> to want to be one of them. Would you have liked to have served on the Supreme Court? You don't have to be a lawyer to be on the Supreme Someone Court. Someone raised that question. I, you know, the first time I heard that raised, yeah. it was back in uh, 1980. And I was, I'd just given a talk on Capitol Hill, and we were walking across, I was walking across the, the, the Capitol grounds with a bunch of young uh, legislative aides. And I said, I poo-pooed the whole thing. And among those young legislative aides was a young man named Clarence Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you two stayed friends and oh, yes. became yeah. friends? Yes. You know, yes. And you, you approved of his confirmation? And oh, absolutely, my God. I, I thought it was a truly horrible thing that happened to him. Uh, you know, I, I've, uh, he and I have talked, you know, alone for hours on various occasions. And uh, never has he ever used any language that couldn't have been repeated in Sunday school. So the thought that you know, he did all this stuff was absolutely... I mean, you know, sometimes... So that brings you to the conclusion that Anita Hill lied. Oh, yes. Uh, but I, I could also have analyzed it. I, in fact, I wish I hadn't simply dismissed it because, think about it, she said um, that at first she didn't even want Clarence to be told that she was the source of this story. Now imagine, two people are alone when something happens. And then years later, someone comes in and tells you a story. How hard would it be to guess who the other person was if the, if, if the story if it really happened? And what earthly point would there be in not telling him? So what do you think her motivation was? Oh, there, there's, a, there's tons of it uh, out there. Uh, I mean, people don't go to Yale Law School in order to teach at Orville or Roberts University. Yeah. But she's not there now. She's the I right. know, but I'm saying, yeah. you know, uh, she, had, she had a lot to try to explain away. People don't, people don't go into a big Washington law firm in order to quit and become a government employee. So she was looking for an explanation. That, that's one possibility. But, the, but I, I've read other things and learned other things from other sources. About her? Yes. And, uh, you know, that she didn't get the job that she wanted. Uh, there are a lot of things. Yeah. And, and you're pleased with Justice uh, 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 Thomas on the court? Oh, well, yes, my God. He's one of, he's one of, his... he's one of, he's one of three people that uh, still believe uh, that the Constitution means what it says. The other is Scalia and Rehnquist? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk. good guesses. Well, okay. The vision of the anointed, self-congratulations as a basic for social policy. Mm. I mean, you posit here that they're a group of self-anointed elitists mm. who are responsible for what in America? 
Well, for much, much of the social policy of the past 30 years and for the disastrous consequences that have followed from those policies. And who are these people? Well, there would be people in the media, in the academic world, and in politics, uh, particularly those who believe that uh, third parties can make better decisions than people can make for themselves, and particularly when they are those third parties. Uh, I, I think most people who have not been in the academic world would have to see the academics in action to realize how deeply they believe this. I can remember a conference at Middlebury College some years ago yeah. in which they were laying out these plans for how they would manipulate the poor in order to get them to do this, to do that, to do the other. And I said, who are we yeah. to be running these people's lives? And they looked at me as if I were a man from Mars speaking a language they had never heard before. Do you therefore believe, I mean, I, I, this is almost university kind of debate. Do you therefore believe that that the government has no responsibility uh, for those uh, less fortunate than ourselves? Uh, if free enterprise, they cannot find a place in the market economy? Well, there are many things the government can do. I think the most important thing they can do is maintain a framework of law in which people do, in fact, find jobs and find progress. After all, this is not a hypothetical question as if this situation has never come up before. I mean, look at the entire history of the United States. Yeah. I mean, the United, the United States did not become a prosperous country only after the New Deal. I mean, history didn't begin in the 1960s or even in the 1930s. Uh, and you look at the history of blacks, for that matter, you know, that uh, blacks have come a very long way, long before the first civil rights law was passed in, 19, in the 1960s. Uh, in fact, in the five years prior to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Blacks rose into professional and similar occupations to a greater extent than in the five years afterwards. So you would have, even if you were, if you look back now mm. as an economist and, and, and in some ways as a historian at the civil rights legislation that was passed in 64, 65, mm -hmm. uh, and through the great society, you, in, in terms of voting rights as well, you would say those laws, those civil rights laws were unnecessary and oh, counterproductive? Oh, no, no. There, and so, oh, you had, you had to get rid of the Jim Crow system. You had to have, you had to have voting rights and so on. But I remember back in 1964 writing to a friend as the Civil Rights Act of 64 was being uh, brought out in Congress that I hoped this law would pass with absolutely no crippling amendments exactly as it was written because, uh, among other things, they had some good things in it but one, was one reason. But the other reason was that I was convinced that it would not have the effect that they thought it would have. And, that one, and, and where I, what I assumed, very incorrectly, was that once people saw that, yes, this would break down the Jim Crow system, it would not cause any dramatic improvement in the economic condition of black people. That, you know, and that people would then say, no, now we have to turn to something else in order to do that. And I was completely wrong about that, that when, when, when it didn't produce that result, they said, well, that just shows we need more of the same. Which is, which is the old argument. You know, we try policy X and it absolutely does, goes nowhere. We need stronger policy X. As you, this argument has been, I'm sure, voiced to you before. Mm. Clarence Thomas benefited from affirmative action. Who said so? Clarence Thomas says so, I bet. No. He doesn't. No, he does not. Clarence Thomas does not say that, that uh, affirmative action programs helped him in terms of the educational opportunities he no, he's received. Never said, he's never said it to me. Do you I, believe he, do you think he would say no? To that question, he might well. For one thing, uh, I, I, for one thing, I, my understanding, and I, you know, I haven't researched it. My understanding is that he was admitted uh, to college the year before they began their affirmative action program. I don't know his and answer. What, and what and what and, and, and what the program did was to delegitimize what he had done. Yeah. That he had, he was a man with an outstanding academic record. Right. Uh, and he, and he goes out into the job market, and people, and despite this... And they look at him and they say, you got there only because of affirmative that, action right. rather than no. because of your own merits. Yeah, which is, whereas, just, whereas, whereas, ordinarily, someone with that kind of record, you'd look at it and say, hey, this guy is really a world beater. Hot, yeah. uh, but no, and I've seen that in my own life. Uh, I'm old enough that uh, I can, I've gone through the whole metamorphosis. And what have you seen in your own life? All right. When I was in the, in the Marine Corps in the, in the, in the, during the Korean War, I was trained as a photographer. And uh, I, I was assigned to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, where a great many of Southerners were in the Marine Corps, white Southerners. And in that barracks, whenever somebody had a photographic problem, his camera wasn't working, his pictures didn't come out right, and so forth, they would come to me. I was astonished that the most biggest redneck in the, in the, in the barracks would come to me to ask me. And there were all these white photographers. fix my camera. <laughs> yeah. You say, you know, why, why is this? And I finally figured it out. They said, you know, if this guy is black and he's a photographer, he must be some photographer. 
you know. Now, <laughs> uh, when I started teaching in the ni early 1960s at the Douglas College, yeah. I read up on all the stuff about new teachers. You're seeing how uh, it's hard to get the respect of the students, particularly yeah. if you're not much older than they yeah. are. And I looked younger than I was. Uh, and so I, I worried about that, you see. And I walked in that room the first day, and there was instant respect. And I, I, I you know, it, it sort of took me aback. And I, and, I, and I realized, no, no, they, they, they're, they're saying, look, this guy, I was the first black male to teach there. This guy must be something else, you know. Go forward now, 10 years. By this time, I've completed my degree. I've written my books, journal, like all the whole thing. I'm now teaching at UCLA. And students will come up to me at the end of the term. They'll say how much they like the course and all that. Uh, and somewhere in the course of that, yeah. there'll be a slip up and they'll let it, let it out that they were quite surprised that the course was as good as it was. And one of, the, one of the things that struck me even before the end of the term, one kid came to me one day and he had a passage in the book he was having trouble with. Yeah. And he said, can you tell me what this means? And I explained to him what that passage meant. He said, are you sure? And I said, yes, I wrote the textbook. And he looked in the front and he was really embarrassed. <laughs> <You know? laughs> But this is what affirmative action has done, you see. So you can't see any positive oh, I'm sure, contributions I don't doubt, to I don't affirmative doubt, action. I don't doubt it, that. In minute. fact, it increased the pool, as you know, as frequently used, the expression of what affirmative what action that, can do is increase the pool of I don't evidence. know what that means, and I, I've never had anybody explain it to me. I've studied affirmative action in this country, in India, in Malaysia, you know, in Sri Lanka, in Nigeria. Uh, they have they have some version of it in uh, Israel. Well, I'm going to explain it as it was explained to me. It is the notion of it, it let's say you're on the admissions committee at Harvard, mm. and you're going to choose so many people. You're going to let people in for a variety of reasons. One is sheer academic merit. Uh, they scored 1,600 on the college boards. Mm. That's a good entry. They've got a brilliant uh, academic and athletic background, mm. and they happen to be a virtuoso violin player. Mm -hmm. you know? oh, yeah. And the violin player helps. Yeah. Or let's say they come from Nevada, mm, and they don't right. have a lot of Nevadans yeah. at Harvard. And let's also say that they uh, are come from uh, Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. They don't have many people from Sri Lanka yes. there. And let's also say that, that they also are African American. Mm -hmm. And that that ought to be a factor in in choosing from that pool. Maybe that's one of the because, considerations. Because what? Uh, because diversity of a student now, body I, I is a it's... healthy factor. I, I'm I'm fascinated with the extent to which words we, we're, we're conditioned to react like Pavlov's dog to words. I hear diversity. Someone was asking. That'll me make I... me look bad, professor. <laughs> <laughs> Someone today who was a, who was, a, who was, a, who was a trustee of a college was saying that the, they were going to pick a new college professor. I said, what you should do is have a stopwatch there yeah. and just count how long it is to, 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 to each of the uh, contestants says the word diversity. Yeah. And the guy who says it, you know, he's 35 minutes into the interview. And the other guy who says it, you know, the first sentence, the guy who said it takes 35 minutes, he should be at the top of the list. The guy who said it the first sentence should be at the bottom. Because the well, question well, is... What's wrong with diversity? I don't get the point. My point is that this is a word that has become magic. What does it mean? If anything... Are you saying to me that all black people are alike, therefore you've got to mix and match by race? It's not diverse unless it's diverse along these no, dimensions? No, I'll tell you what I'm saying. I'm saying that I think that it would be different to have people of different kinds of experiences. Uh, and we mentioned Sri Lanka, didn't we? And, you know, and it'd be interesting to have some people uh, with an Asian oh, wait, background. No, no, wait, wait. wait, wait. An Asian background, African-American, uh, people uh, that come from... Uh, Fifth Avenue and Park Avenue, as well as from Henderson, North Carolina. All of that would make a healthy student body. You mean to tell me? I don't me think everybody ought to come from uh, the sons of, of uh, Harvard graduates. All right. Or daughters. May, may, uh, partly because they, they're not always the best students. No, that's right. <laughs> but, but uh, uh, all right. Um, That argument, I, I think, that, does, that doesn't make it. I, I, I uh, slipped my point there for, for a minute. Well, I mean, I, I, you have thought long and hard about this and, and much longer than I have, and you bring to no, bear but wait, wait, much, but look, much but more that, that's powerful, the theory. That's the theory. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the facts are quite different. In places like Harvard and Stanford and right. Cornell, what you, what you have is the black son of the black doctor right, who right, lived in the same right, neighborhood right. with the white son of the white doctor. Right. No, I got and you. now yeah. you're giving me diversity because these two people well, probably would not go no, someplace. No, 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 not necessarily. They have scholarships that they offer to kids who but, are not but, the but son that, of that, the But now we're getting away from the whole racial thing. I'm saying the racial thing has been used as a proxy for something that is not a proxy for because the vast majority 
of blacks who go to places like Harvard and, Col and Cornell and Stanford are not blacks from the ghetto. Those are blacks from out there. You know, they're from Malibu. Uh, you know, they're from Pacific Palisades. Uh, they're but, from Winnetka and okay, so forth. And, and they're, they're from the very same neighborhoods. Are. They're from the very same neighborhoods as the whites are there. Mm -hmm. And so and so now you call it diversity right. because you see something with the, with, with, with the naked eye. All right, let me make a couple other points because I'm, I'm going to weigh ahead of myself here. Uh, do you think that the era of these uh, social engineers from whatever establishment they come from, media, academia, government, is over? No. I wish it were. I think they're going to go underground, they're going to hunker down and, 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 and uh, wait, wait out the <laughs> wait storm. Wait for the storm to change. Uh, absolutely. And we have people in the, uh, in the, among, among the Republicans, for example, who, uh, I, I say these things like this are like crabgrass. You've got to root it out. Do not cut back on the appropriations for the National <laughs> Endowment. If you're not going to get rid of it... You don't want to gut... Come on. I mean, you clearly don't want to gut the, na the National Endowment. I do endowment. not. I want to destroy it entirely. Of you course I don't want to gut it. You want to dismantle <laughs> it. That's right, because it, it's like crabgrass. And crab while grass. you're at it, get public television as well. You, you got it. But, uh, uh, <laughs> well, you'll never appear on the Miller again, and thank you very much. <laughs> I never have anyway. <laughs> well. uh, no, but it's like crabgrass. These people are going to hunker down, and then they'll, they'll wait for the, for the yeah. change of the political thing. And I say these guys are like somebody who's putting a lawnmower over well, crabgrass. But these guys you seem to be saying are everywhere. I mean, no, why not these guys? About, I mean, I mean, like, oh, when a minute Republican. home, but you're not talking about just bureaucrats. You're saying, I mean, you're saying it's the New York Times, it's CBS, oh, oh, absolutely, it's, absolutely, it's Harvard University and the Yale faculty, oh, and, absolutely, you and got the it. UCLA faculty yes. and the Stanford faculty, yes, all of them. Oh, absolutely. You know, it, what it, it amazes me is that you buy into these conspiracies like this. That some conspiracy? No, not a conspiracy at all. <laughs> that when somehow people, when people, no, no, all no, these no, people, no, 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 all not these at all. people, I never believe in conspiracy theories. All these theories. people somehow have come to, of power in the establishment, have come to this like-minded idea about. Oh, that's happened many times in history. Self-appointed. And I don't believe for a minute. I think if people at Harvard meet wholly independently and, and sealed off from people from Stanford, yeah. and they go into those committee rooms, they will come out with the same kinds of policies because they went in with the same assumptions. And, bec and because their experiences, you suggest, are essentially the same. Probably. Well, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Then why do they come to the same conclusions? Oh, because they operate under the same assumptions. And why do they have the same assumptions? For reasons which you can go back into well, history. Oh, no, no, come on. Why do they have the same assumptions? What do you mean go back in history? Uh, this has been a set of assumptions that's been very popular among intellectuals. What has happened in our time is that intellectuals have been taken much more seriously since the 60s than they were before. I think we're suffering the consequences of it. It's not the first time in history that intellectuals have been taken seriously uh, and disasters have followed. So we shouldn't have taken Milton Friedman seriously? Milton Friedman uh, no. is, one, is, one, is a very no, 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 atypical intellectual. You can't play this game and say, well, no, no. we shouldn't take intellectuals seriously and then accept those no, that no. I happen to think are no, right. No, no, we should no, take no, them no, seriously. No. By, by, ser by seriously, I mean in the sense, I should have clarified this, in the sense that they are exempted from the test of facts. Did it work? When I hear people come on the air and say these lofty things, like, I say to myself, show me where we've ever gotten better off listening to people like this. Right. All right. I, 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 I see these psychologists no, coming no, on and say, how you should raise your children. I said... How are children better today now that we've been listening to these people for 30 years? Are they happier? Are they more learned? Uh, you know, test scores go down, venereal yeah. disease goes up, yeah. suicide rates go up. In what way are we better off for having listened to them? But it seems to me that you do engage a little bit in group dismissal. That you, in a sense, wave your hand at, no, at no, anybody no, no, there, on the rather than saying that... that each of these kinds of institutions, or that there is not a group think in the institution. There, there is. May, you, you, you tell me that, that uh, uh, you know, group think. Someone did, did a survey at Stanford a couple of years ago. They found whole departments in which there was not one Republican. Why then whole does... Whole departments. Why is it that on the Washington... I mean, look at the editorial. People mm -hmm. who write the editorials and, and for, under the bylines or for the paper of the Washington Post. You've got George Will there, and mm -hmm. certainly what George Will says is different from what David Broder says. Oh, absolutely. And certainly what Bill Sapphire says is quite different from what Tom Friedman says from what... Oh, absolutely. Uh, Maureen Dow thinks. Absolutely. But They're all Will, part of the New York Times. That's, that's very true. Yeah. But... The fact is that they are the exceptions. They are the exceptions, as Milton Friedman is the exception. And the only good guys are the exceptions, or, well, and meaning gender-free. 
<laughs> but you use the word dismissal. That's not that's, yeah, that's one of the words I I, I I latch onto in the chapter about the vocabulary yeah. of the anointed. That whenever you reach a conclusion Wait, okay. that, that, is, that is different from what from what they have, they say you've dismissed it. You can spend three <laughs> volumes analyzing it, and at the end you come up and saying it's wrong. Oh, he dismissed it. Yeah. All right. Um, the vision of the anointed self congratulations <laughs> as a basis for social powers. Tom, for, as a basis for social policy, uh, Thomas Sowell, we thank you for joining us this evening. We look forward to seeing you next time. See you then. If you haven't already, please check out and install the Brave browser. It is the best for speed, compatibility, and privacy. If you're using it already, go ahead and hit that triangle up in the corner, and it's a great way to show your support for this channel. You can also earn basic attention tokens when you use Brave, which you can convert to Bitcoin, U.S. dollars, whatever you want. It's a great way for you to earn the ad revenue instead of the other guys. There are lots of great referral links in the description. These are at no additional cost to you, and they're fantastic offers. These are all services I use myself. I really appreciate every way you guys support this channel. Take care. Bye-bye.